Well, this morning we're continuing our study in 1 Timothy. I invite you to turn to 1 Timothy in your, in your Bibles. And we're in the second week of chapter 1. We're going to conclude chapter 1. And as I mentioned, you have an outline on the back of your bulletin to help you follow along and see some divisions of thought here. And I'm going to read through chapter, I'm sorry, verse 12 through verse 20. And I'll be reading again from the New American Standard. Paul writes, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. Yet I was shown mercy because... I acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am the foremost of all. Yet, for this reason, I found mercy, so that in me as foremost... Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now, to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keeping faith in a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to the faith. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. That is our text for this morning. Last week, we looked at the first 11 verses, and we saw the, the command to stop false teachers in verse 3. And we saw the contrasting fruit of true and false teachers, and we looked at the pathology of false teachers, and we looked at the tool of false teachers. We saw that the tool of false teachers is in verse 7 and verse 8. They wanted to be teachers of the law. Paul says, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. So not all teachers, not all false teachers teach the same thing, but they all use the same tool, and that's the Word of God. All false teachers use the Word of God because it is the Word of God that the church is built upon and it is the Word of God that the church is centered around. And so it is the tool that they use. It's the Word of God that saves us. It's the Word of God that sanctifies us. It's the Word of God that He uses to reveal Himself to us and to guide us. And so it is the tool that false teachers use. We get this concept. It's like trying to poison the well. If you can poison the well, well, you know what happens. So these false teachers were apparently using the law in an unlawful way, and they were trying to apply it to believers in a way that it wasn't intended to be applied. Paul has to make that point. It has to be used lawfully. And we get a little look at potentially the way they were using it in chapter 4, Chapter 4, verse 3, Paul says that these are men who they forbid marriage and they advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in. So these false teachers were taking the Mosaic law that was intended for Israel as a theocracy and they were trying to bind believers to it in ways it was never intended to be used. Now, we're not exactly certain of what their teachings were, and that's okay, because what we are certain of is the fruit that it produced. And that's what we saw in verse 4. 
They were giving, giving attention to myths and endless genealogies. And the fruit of it, the corrupt fruit, was that it produced mere speculation. Whereas the fruit of faithfulness is the administration of God, which, says in, which is by faith, or the administration of God in faith. So we saw this contrasting fruit. We don't need to know what exactly their fruit was to know that it was corrupt. When you know the good, it's easy to spot the bad. The good fruit is the administration of God, which is by faith. This is the service of God. And it has a goal. Its goal is love. Now, this is Christian love. This is not love as the world defines it. That's why we're reminded not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. You see, the world is constantly applying pressure to conform us to its definition of love. We hear it all the time. That's not loving. Oh, the loving way to do things. Do this in love. We hear it from the world all the time. So we have to be careful as believers to make sure that we're being transformed by the renewing of our minds and to interpret text properly. Because if we're not careful, we'll be changed by the world's definition of love and we'll read that into the text and we can't do that. That's to misinterpret God's word. We need to know the way God intended it. And this love is a byproduct. It's a Christian love, and therefore it's a byproduct. It springs forth from three things found in verse 5, from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. This is why we preach the Word of God. Because when the Word of God is taught and applied, it produces a sincere faith in the person of Christ rather than in our good works, rather than in a profession of faith, our faith becomes sincere because it has the right object. The object of our faith is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and his work on our behalf. So the word of God gives us a sincere faith. It also informs our conscience so that we know how to walk in a manner that's pleasing to the Lord. We can then have a good conscience by knowing what we're doing is the right thing. And when we preach the word of God, it cleanses our hearts because it convicts us of our sin. And through the ongoing process of confession of sin and the cleansing from that sin, we have a continually cleaned heart and communion with our God. And so when these three things come together, a clean heart, a sincere faith, and a good conscience, the necessary byproduct is love. And that makes sense. The primary mark of the fruit of the Spirit is love. In Galatians 5, the leading off the list of the fruit of the Spirit is love. Paul reminded the Corinthians that the greatest of these is love. But instead of focusing on the administration of God, the, the teaching of the Word of God, these false teachers were focusing on what Paul calls myths and endless genealogies. Verse 7, they wanted to be teachers of the law. They didn't care about the people of God. These were self-serving motives. And what this tells us, they wanted to be teachers of the law. These were not ministers of the gospel. These were ministers of death. The law can only kill. It cannot give life. So, Paul's left Timothy, his beloved son in the faith in Ephesus, to reform this church here. We saw that in verse 3. As I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. Paul had warned the church in Ephesus in Acts 20 that this would happen. That men from amongst them, from amongst them own selves would arise teaching perverse things to draw the disciples away. And apparently, apparently the elders really didn't heed this close enough. And now the situation required apostolic intervention. It required Paul coming there and fixing the problem. And we see the sovereignty and the goodness of God in this. Romans 8 reminds us that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God. 
God, in one sense, allowed this circumstance to play out in Ephesus so that we would have this letter today. Without the situation in Ephesus, we wouldn't have this letter. So God used this for good, just as Romans 8 teaches us that God uses all things together for good. That's a, that's a scripture verse that if I could, I would write it on the inside of your eyelids so that when you close your eyes to pray or close your eyes to sleep, you would be reminded of the fact that God causes all things to work together for good for his people. I would write it on your hands so that when you drive and when you write and when you type, you would see it and be reminded of it. Because the fact of the matter is we suffer in this world many times and in many ways. And the fact of the matter is the Lord Jesus Christ loved us enough that he paid for the sin of every single one of us who believe. And he paid the penalty for every single sin, past, present, and future. That is a great love. But the reality is that we are just a tiny little dot in the picture of salvation. God is somehow working all things for good for his people. We find ourselves just to be a little tiny, tiny blip in the, big scram- in the big scheme of things. So we need to remember that, that whatever we're going through, we don't necessarily always know why, but we know that God is using it for good. And God used the situation in Ephesus for good, and now we have this letter for the church. So Paul has been pointing out in verse 11 that he had been entrusted with the glorious gospel of the blessed God. And we see Paul continuing his line of thought now in verse chapter 12. And what Paul says, um, our English translation swaps the word order a little bit, and it still says the same thing, but it loses a little bit of the emphasis. The emphasis is that Paul says, I thank the one who strengthened me. That's the emphasis. I thank the one who strengthened me. And he identifies that as Christ Jesus, our Lord. And we've got to remember that Paul is always making a logical and a theological argument. He's in the middle of an argument. This is not a stream of consciousness of whatever comes to Paul's mind. This whole section is a cohesive argument with a point. This line is a line in a divinely inspired letter to a church and to us. This portion has a purpose. And the purpose is that Paul is grounding his authority, his message, his calling in the person of Christ. He's grounding this in the person of Christ. It's not merely a giving of thanks. It is, no doubt, a giving of thanks. But he's giving thanks to the one who strengthened him. And that's his point. Now, this this strengthening has the idea of making one adequate to do a task, of equipping somebody to do what they've been called to do. It has a purpose. It's it's more than just adding strength. It's goal-specific. It has an intention. And Paul explains what he means by the fact that Christ strengthened him. Paul has mentioned two other times in Scripture this strengthening. Once in Philippians, he says that he he can do all things through Christ who gives him strength. And that's an ongoing basis. And in another time in Acts, he refers to a, a vision that he had when the Lord came to him during difficult times and the Lord strengthened him. But that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about when he was converted and put into service. And we see that from our text here. But before we get to the putting into service. Look at the next clause. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful. That's why he thanks the Lord, this one who strengthened him, because he considered me faithful, Paul says. Considered. This has the idea of coming to a conclusion and then acting. This is when you get to the bottom line and then you act. There's one other time this word's used in relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's found in Philippians 2. Turn there with me. Philippians 2. We refer to this portion of Scripture as the kenosis, the word for emptying. Paul's writing to those in Philippi chapter 2 of Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. Paul says, have this attitude. 
in yourselves. Think this way. Think this way so that it produces results. What attitude, Paul? Well, it's the attitude that was in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, he had the outward manifestation of God, because he was God. He was God, so he manifested it outwardly. He existed in the form of God. He did not regard, that's our same word for considered, he did not consider what? Equality with God a thing to be grasped. We could state it from a, uh, this is a negative statement, he did not, let's turn it to a positive. He considered equality with God not something that he had to, to grasp. He considered equality with God not something that he had to grasp, and it caused a result. He emptied himself by taking on, emptied himself by taking on the form of a slave. So rather than outwardly manifesting his deity, he added humanity to himself. Without ever ceasing to be what he'd always been, he became what he had never been. He added humanity to himself. So, because he did not regard, because he did not consider this outward manifestation of deity as something that he had to grab, he acted and he took on human flesh. And because of that, we have salvation. It's the idea of this word, that it considers and then it acts. So, go back to 1 Timothy. Paul thanks the Lord Jesus Christ because the Lord Jesus Christ considered him faithful. This means that the all-wise, all-knowing, all-powerful God made a decision to make Paul faithful. Paul's in the middle of an argument here, a logical argument. It's the Lord Jesus Christ who made him faithful. This is the basis for Paul's apostleship. It's the basis for him writing this letter. It's the basis for him being able to leave Timothy in Ephesus. It's the basis for him being able to correct and even reject the false teachers. It's because Christ Jesus made him faithful. And then we have a result. What is the result of being made faithful? He was put into service. Putting me into service, he says. Because he was made faithful, we have a... ING word putting it's a participle of result. The result of being made faithful is that he was put into service. Now this word for service is uh, it's a word where we get deacon. It's the opposite of being a king, of being a ruler. It's the opposite. This is about serving. That's why we translate it here as putting me into service. So the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave this man arguably the greatest honor in all of church history, he didn't make him a king or a ruler. He made him a servant. How did he get this? By grace, not by keeping the law. This was not the results of the law. And that's his point in the previous verses, that the law, if used lawfully, it's not made for the righteous, it's made for the unrighteous. He wasn't made righteous by the law, but by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, because the Lord Jesus Christ considered him faithful. That's how he was saved, and that's how he was put into service, because of the Lord Jesus Christ's sovereign decision to do so. So, in verse 12, for your fill-in-the-blank, you've seen... The person behind Paul. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. Verses 12 through 14 in your outline is, is the call of Paul. We're looking at the call of Paul in 12 through 14. Verse 12, we see the person behind Paul. Verse 13, we're going to see the unworthiness of Paul. What Paul's doing here is he's cutting off an opportunity of anybody being able to question Paul's worthiness or unworthiness. He's getting out in front of them and pointing out, I'm absolutely unworthy. He's not qualified because he is worthy. And that's, that's key. He was always unworthy, but it's the God who qualified him. This isn't a matter of worthiness because nobody's worthy. 
in spite of the fact, this is what he says, in spite of the fact that I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. This looks back again to the law that he mentions in verse 9. We saw from verse 9 and 10 that Paul talks about the law really as a reflection of the Ten Commandments. We see the first few clauses that it was made for the ungodly in verse 9. For the ungodly and sinners and unholy and profane. That mirrors the first half of the Ten Commandments, man's relation to God. And then the rest of it, for those who kill their fathers and mothers and murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers, refers to the second half of the Decalogue, man as man relates to man. Paul's point here is that he was a blasphemer. He'd violated the first table, and he was a persecutor and a violent aggressor. He had broken the second half of the table. It wasn't the law that made him who he was. Not at all all. Let's just look real quickly at Paul's history. Not everybody knows it, and that's okay. Turn back to the book of Acts chapter 7. We'll spend just a minute here. Acts chapter 7, and we find ourselves in Acts chapter 7 at the end of a a speech, a fantastic speech by Stephen, and he's about to get killed because of this speech. When he presses the word of God to unbelievers, it incites rage. Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit when he did this. He was not preaching in hate. He was preaching by the power of the Holy Spirit, and the product was rage in his hearers, and hate in his hearers. If you read with me in verse 58 of chapter 7, When they'd driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. That is Paul. Turn over to 8, verse 1. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. Move on to verse 3. But Saul began ravaging the church entering house after house and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. Go to Acts 22. Paul's giving his defense. He's defending himself against false charges. Acts chapter 22, verse 4, Paul says, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prisons, and also the high priest and all the council of elders can testify. From them, I also received letters to the brethren, not believing brethren, just Jews. I received letters to the brethren and started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. But it happened that as I was on my way approaching Damascus about noontime, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me, and I fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? See, to persecute believers is to persecute the Lord Jesus Christ because we are His body. He dwells in us, and us in Him. We are more than just His people. We are His very body. To persecute his people was to persecute him. Paul picks up in verse 8, And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus the Nazarene whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me, they saw the light to be sure, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Get up, go into Damascus, and there you will be told of all that has been appointed for you to do. Skip down to verse 14. Ananias is now meeting with Paul and he tells him, The God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. Now why do you delay? Get up, 
and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Paul was the worst of the worst. He'd broken the entire law. But how was it that he was made righteous? And how did he maintain his righteousness? It's not through the law. And that's his point. So these false teachers are misusing the law. It was Christ Jesus who strengthened him and equipped him and put him into service, even though he was a lawbreaker. One commentator has referred to this as the conversion of a legalist. Because elsewhere, Paul says, he says that uh, regarding the law, he was blameless. So from an external look, and from people who don't even understand the law, like these false teachers in verse 7, from people who really don't understand the law, from the outward, it looked like Paul was perfect. Yet the reality is that he'd broken all the law. Because the law really is related to our heart. It's related to the inner man, which is how the Lord Jesus Christ could say, if you look upon a woman with lust, if you merely look with lust, you've already committed adultery in your heart. We're not talking about external conformity here. Now Paul continues on. He says, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. So we've, we've seen in verse 13 the unworthiness of the Apostle Paul. And now we're going to see the grace given to Paul in verse 14, and really the end of 13. Paul says, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. He explains that he received mercy and tells us why. It's because he acted ignorantly. See, he lived and he existed in the sphere or the realm of unbelief. That's where he lived. This is the realm of all unsaved men. All men by nature live in a state of unbelief until the Lord gives them faith. They're dead in their trespasses and sin. Their minds are useless for the things of God. They cannot discern spiritual matters. And so trapped in the sphere of unbelief, they act ignorantly. That's what Paul did. And yet, in verse 14, Paul received grace. The grace of our Lord, he says, was more than abundant. We use three English words to translate one Greek word. The Greek word just means superabundant, overflowing abundance. The grace of our Lord was more than abundant. How was it that Paul came to be an apostle? How did he receive authority? How did he get saved? Grace. Grace. And coupled with grace were faith and love. He previously acted in unbelief, but now he has faith. He previously was a blasphemer. Now he loves God. He previously was a violent persecutor. And now he loves the brethren. So coupled with this grace were faith and love. And so really in verses 12, 13, and 14, we have a, a literary structure of A, B, a, what Paul received, who Paul was, what Paul received. What he received, who he was, what he received. Sandwiched in the middle of the grace of God is who God, is who Paul was. He was the worst of the worst, and yet the Lord put him into service and gave him great grace. The person behind Paul, the unworthiness of Paul, and the grace given to Paul. We look at verses 15, 16, and 17. We're going to look at the Lord of Paul. The Lord of Paul. And we start by looking at the mission of Christ in verse 15. The mission of Christ in verse 15. Paul says, this is a trustworthy statement. Deserving of full acceptance. That first clause is found five times in the New Testament, all by Paul. <clears throat> Two more times in this book. Uh, we have it in 3.1 and in 4.9. Here, 3.1 and 4.9. And then we find it in 2 Timothy 2.11 and Titus 3.8. 2 Timothy 2.11, Titus 3.8. And then in this very book, 
in chapter 3, verse 1, and chapter 4, verse 9. A trustworthy statement, Paul says. Uh, this is likely, we don't know for certain, this is likely an early church creed, a statement of faith, some sort of doctrinal statement that the church has had, and he's reaffirming it. It is a trustworthy statement, and it's deserving of full acceptance. What is it, Paul? It's that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Christ Jesus came, this is speaking past tense, it's not merely his incarnation or his death and resurrection, it's all of it. He came into the world to save sinners, and it speaks to his pre-existence. He pre-existed and then came into the world. <clears throat> Where did he come into? He came into the world, and then it's modified by a clause to do what? To save. To save who? To save sinners. This speaks to a purpose or a goal. Christ Jesus, the preexistent one, entered into the world with a purpose, and the purpose was to save people from a particular group. What group is that? Sinners. Aren't you glad? <laughs> That's all I see when I look out from here. And when I look in the mirror, nothing but sinners. It's all he came to save was sinners. So if you don't find yourself in that category, then there's no hope for you. This is the reality of it. That's his own words. I didn't come to call the righteous. That's what he said. He came to save sinners. This is our category. It's a purpose statement. It's not an extent statement. statement. It doesn't say he saved all sinners. All it says is purpose. Clarifies the type of people that he came to save. But I will argue that this is something that he accomplishes, without a doubt. Whatever the work that he was entrusted to do, he did, flawlessly, without missing a mark or falling short. He came into the world to save sinners, and he is doing it. Whoever he came to save will be saved. Make no mistake, he never fails. Whoever he came to save will be saved. Look at verse, verse 16. <clears throat> but before I get there, let me just close out there, 15. He says, among whom I am foremost of all. Perfect translation of the Greek into English, present tense, among whom I am. Now, his argument in this text is not based upon his ongoing sinfulness. Though we have that in Romans 7. That's not his point. His point here is that because of who he was, the worst of the worst, persecuting Christians and putting them to death, because of who he was, the worst of the worst, he found mercy. Let's flesh this out. He says, yet for this reason. For what reason, Paul, in verse 16? For the fact that he was, and still is, the foremost of all. First off, what that means is that Paul never forgot who he was. He was a sinner saved by grace. He was a sinner saved by grace. Now, Paul, when he refers to other believers, he always calls them saints. You will never see him refer to other believers as sinners. But when he refers to himself, he remembers that he is always a sinner saved by grace. He is now holy, no doubt. He is a saint now, no doubt. But it's still the reality is that he is a sinner saved by grace. And it's because of that he can carry out his mission in gentleness and humility without pride. Because he knows that he's a sinner saved by grace. And the authority that he has, it has nothing to do with his own worthiness. It has to do with the sovereign choice of God. And I think we need to consider that as brothers and sisters, not only in the way we carry out whatever authority we've been given, not only that, but even thinking about the authority itself. Everybody here has been given authority, whether it's in your workplace whether it's men as the head of the family, whether it's wives 
who have an authority to come alongside their husband and to, to manage the household. Whatever the authority is that you've been given, you've been given it to use. You have no choice in this matter. You must use the authority that you've been given. You must use it for the purpose and in the way that God intended it. You must use it the way he intends and for the purpose he intends, but you must use it. It was not given to you as an option. Paul says, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. He understood that. And we must all understand that. For this reason, he says, I found mercy so that... This is the second time he mentioned mercy. Back in 13, he said, I was shown mercy because. It's not a purpose statement there in 13. He was shown mercy even though, we could say, or actually better would be, I was shown mercy uh, in light of the fact that I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And in the Old Testament law, there was provision for that, that if unintentional sin could be forgiven, high-handed intentional sin No. Unintentional sin could be forgiven. But now we have the purpose statement of the mercy. So that, he says in 16, yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Paul was saved, not for Paul's own good, but so that Jesus Christ could hold him up as an example to those who, future tense, would believe. You think Paul knew that when he got saved? I would argue that he didn't. But I would remind you of what I told you earlier about Romans 8 and God causing all things to work together for good. I don't know what you're going through But God's not only using it for good, but it's much bigger than you. His purposes are so much bigger than just you. Think about it with Paul. Yes, he loved Paul and he saved Paul and he poured innumerable riches upon Paul. But the purpose that he saved Paul was for Christ's own good. And not only for Christ's own good, but for the love of the people who would be saved in the future. Look at that. That Paul lifts him up and is a, as an example so that nobody could ever say, I'm too great a sinner. Nobody can ever say, I'm too great a sinner. No, 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 no. That's why he saved Paul. That is why he saved Paul. That's why he let Paul do what he did and ravage the church. Do you see the sovereignty of God in this? Working all things. He let Paul ravage the church so that Paul would be the worst, so that Paul could be raised up as an example of the power of Christ. There's nobody outside of his grasp. So take that to heart. Parents praying for children, children praying for parents, brothers and sisters praying for other unsaved family. Paul wasn't saved until after quite a time of wickedness. But he was saved. Nobody is beyond the reach of God. Nobody's beyond the reach of God. And Paul bursts now into a doxology. What began in verse 12 as thanksgiving ends in verse 17 with a doxology. One of the reformers John Calvin expresses his pastoral heart in his commentary on this. Here's what he writes. He says of Paul, his enthusiasm breaks out into this exclamation since he could find no words to express his gratitude. These sudden outbursts of Paul's come mainly when the vastness of the subject overpowers him and makes him break off what he is saying. For what could be more wonderful than Paul's conversion? And at the same time, He admonishes all of us by his example that we should never think of the grace shown in God's calling without being lost in wondering admiration. This sublime praise of God's grace swallows up all the memory of his former life. How great a deep is the glory of God. 
Paul says, now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. Does your heart not say the same thing as you consider your own conversion? Does it not cause you to praise this amazing God in light of who you were? The King Eternal always has been, always will be. Immortal, there's no other source but Him. Invisible, no eye can see Him. Pure Spirit, the only God. To Him belongs all the honor and all the glory forever and ever. Now, Paul is going to close chapter one. And all of chapter one follows a fairly simple structure. It's like a A, B, B, A structure. It's very simple. We have the command to silence false teachers. We have the error being taught. Then we have the truth. And then we have the command to silence false teachers. It's a very simple flow. Very simple flow. So now he restates, he restates, fight the good fight. It's in your outline, fight the good fight. So in your outline, if you're missing some blanks, verse 15, we covered that. Verse 16 was the unworthiness of Paul. Verse 17 is the God of us all. Verse 17, the God of us all. Verse 18, 18 through 20 in your outline, fight the good fight. And this is going to break into two sections, how to fight internally and how to fight externally. How to fight internally, how to fight externally. We're going to see internally in 18 through 19, Paul in one sense repeats himself, but not merely repeats himself. He says, this command I entrust to you, O Timothy, my son. After Paul reminds Timothy and his hearers, remember this was written to the church in Ephesus to be read publicly. All of them have now heard who Paul is, where he got his authority. And based upon that authority that was given to Paul, he now commands Timothy in the presence of those who are listening. I entrust this command to you. But not only, he says, am I entrusting it to you, I'm doing it in accordance with the prophecies that were previously made concerning you. Timothy knew what he was talking about. We don't. And it's not necessarily relevant that that we know exactly what prophecies were made concerning him. We do have a hint of it over in uh, chapter 4. 4.14, 4.14, Paul had to tell Timothy, do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. So we had a, a group of elders that prayed for Paul, laid hands upon Paul, I'm sorry, Timothy, because it's true of Paul also, and sent him out. Paul had the same thing happen when he was sent out with Barnabas. The Holy Spirit said, set apart, set apart Paul and Barnabas for the ministry that I have. They laid hands on them and sent them out. It looks like the same thing had happened to Timothy. And so Paul tells him, not only based upon my authority given by the Lord Jesus Christ, but in accordance with God's own commands to you through prophecy. What does he want him to do? He wants him to fight. Fight what? The good fight. Why do we need to call it the good fight? Well, because fighting automatically brings up a negative connotation. Warfare, negative, bad, death. But that's not what's going on here. This is a good fight he is to fight. This is the fight of faith. See, our our warfare is not with flesh and blood. It's a spiritual battle. He's not talking about picking up a metal sword or a handgun. He's talking about picking up the Word of God and advancing the kingship 
of the Lord Jesus Christ through his church by using the word of God to cast down every false idea and every ideology that raises itself up against the knowledge of God. The word of God is to be used as a sword to cut down every competing worldview. Every idea that comes up against the truth of God is to be cut down by the word of God. And that is a good fight because it's souls we're talking about here. We're not talking about pride or money. We're talking about people's eternal destiny. This is a good fight that he is to fight. Sometimes we forget that terminology. We are engaged in a warfare. We are engaged in a warfare. How do you fight the good fight? He tells us. He tells Timothy, knowing that everybody's listening, by keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard, it should be the faith. They've suffered shipwreck in regard to not just their faith, but the faith. What have they rejected? They've rejected a good conscience. That's why we have to have a good conscience. How do we keep the faith? How do we keep the faith? It's actually really simple, but it's also very hard. We keep the faith by learning about our God. We go to his word and we study it and we learn who he is. And in knowing who he is, we can worship him for who he is. And we can pray to him about who he is and the promises that he has given. A simple and yet silly illustration would be like a teenage girl with a poster on her wall of some boy band. She's infatuated with this boy band. She doesn't know anything about them, but she's infatuated with them. But that passes away. And there's people who initially are infatuated with the Lord because they hear about all the good that he does, but they never actually learn who he is. The way you keep the faith is by staying in his word which will then allow you to stay in communion with him. This is how you keep the faith. And they have rejected a good conscience. Everybody here knows what it's like to disobey your conscience. You know when you were not supposed to do something. Or even worse, you know when you were supposed to do something and you didn't. If you continue in that, you will shipwreck the faith. Not only the faith in general, but your personal faith. So the way that we fight it internally in 18 and 19 is by staying in the Word and praying the Word and by keeping a clear conscience. How do we fight it externally? Externally is verse 20. Paul says, Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've handed over to Satan, so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. <clears throat> this Hymenaeus shows up again in 2 Timothy, and uh, Alexander may have, have been with him. Later, Paul will say that this Hymenaeus was teaching that the resurrection had already happened. If you look in... Um, I don't have my verse in front of me. I have failed you this morning. 2.17. I spoke too soon. 2.17, but actually back up in 16, because it really echoes what was at the very beginning of chapter 1. Listen to Paul's instructions to Timothy. Avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. And among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, same guy who have gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place. And they upset, upset the faith of some. How do we fight externally? This is the job of the church. What did Paul do? He cast them out. He handed them over to Satan. What does that mean to hand them over to Satan? This is excommunication. This is church discipline. These men were so dangerous... Hymenaeus and Alexander in particular, that they were kicked out of the church. 
their talk will spread like gangrene. Gangrene kills. There's no recovery from that. And so they were handed over to Satan. It's a similar terminology that we find back in 1 Corinthians. And that's how we know, because we have a parallel passage. Back in 1 Corinthians, these proud Corinthians, you'll see some, some similarities here with today's world and maybe even today's church. These proud Corinthians had a really wicked guy with them. Look at 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5, Paul says, it's actually reported. It's actually reported that there is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind as does not even exist among the Gentiles, that somebody has his father's wife. This guy was having relations with his stepmother. And listen to what they've done. You've become so arrogant and have not mourned instead. (laughs) The purpose that was supposed to happen was that he would have been removed. Read verse 2. You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead, so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. See, their arrogance was in overlooking the sin. The world today wants to tell us that it's arrogant to confront sin and to cast unrepentant sinners out of the church. They tell us that's arrogance and that's pride and that's unloving. Paul condemns their arrogance for not kicking him out. That's how you fight the good fight. By obeying the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 18. He said, he said to kick somebody out, to let them be to you as a Gentile and as a tax collector, that if anybody sins, you go to him. And if he will not listen, you come back with two witnesses. And if they still won't listen, you take it to the church. And if they won't listen to the church, And you put them out, and they are to be like a tax collector and a Gentile, meaning you treat them like an unsaved person who needs the gospel. And you plead with them to repent and believe. Just like Jesus did. Repent and believe. This is what we do, and this is what should have happened. Look at these next couple verses in in chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians. For I on my part, though absent in the body, but present in the spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this, as though I were present in the name of the Lord Jesus when you are assembled, and I with you in spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus. I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? You see, this casting out, not only does it protect the church, but it's restorative to those who are cast out. When we see in chapter 1, verse 20, he's handed them over to Satan. That's to put them out of the church because the whole world lies in the lap of the evil one. Satan is the god of this world. So when you step outside from the fellowship of the saints, you are now removed from the safety that we have as God's people, the special protection of God's people. And now he's to be handed over to Satan so that he'll be taught not to blaspheme. You see, this false teaching is to misrepresent God. To misrepresent God is to blaspheme God. So the way that we fight externally is to throw out the false teachers. We do this as a church. We fight internally. We fight the good fight by keeping ourselves in the faith with a good conscience. And we fight the good fight externally by casting out the false teachers, the wolves who would devour the flock, with the hope that a wolf will be converted into a sheep. So I want you to consider, how would those in Ephesus responded to this letter, the believers. They've heard Paul exhort Timothy to make these changes. They've heard Timothy be commanded to fight the good fight, to silence the false teachers. He's articulated a proper understanding of the gospel. How would they have responded? How would they have come alongside Timothy? What would have been their obligation to Timothy? both in keeping him in line and encouraging him. What would have been the obligation of the elders in that church? 
What would the congregants have expected of their elders? What would they have expected of themselves? What's the proper response? I'm not going to answer it for you. Think about it. Meditate on it. And some of this will be fleshed out as we continue in the rest of the book. We'll see that Timothy is now exhorted to set things in order. And chapter 2 is right in time considering election day. Rather than complain and moan and pray in precatory psalms against those who will be in office soon, um, we're going to be commanded to pray for them, to pray for their salvation. So it's a timely message, the the message of chapter 2, and we'll see that elders are to be set up in accordance with uh, certain standards. We're to see how the family is to be handled. So Paul's going to answer to some degree how this letter should be responded to, but I want to encourage you to get alone with the Lord and examine your own hearts, examine your own motives, examine your own experiences, your church experiences, and examine it in light of the Word of God.